Kitco News special coverage of Bitcoin 2022 is brought to you by Coin Payments, crypto payments made easy. We're back at Bitcoin Miami here with Grant McCarty. He's the director of policy and public affairs at Bitcoin Magazine. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having you, Grant. <laughs> thanks for having me. And yeah. I, yeah, and I told you, uh, and I told you, well, thanks for having me because you, <laughs> apparently you told me that offline your company is involved with, uh, actually the uh, parent company is involved with the uh, organization of this entire event, right? Bitcoin Miami, one of the largest conferences, the largest Bitcoin conference in the world. It's the largest Bitcoin conference in the world, yeah. the largest crypto event in history, the apparently it's the largest finance event in the US yeah. that was announced at the beginning of the conference. Yeah. This is breaking all sorts of records. Um, it's been unreal. Uh, it, it's been it's been a big trend upwards, right? Have, have you been involved with this conference for a while? Is this your first year? Or uh, this is my first year uh, okay. being involved in the, in the company, um, yeah. and and uh, even just being involved at a high level, uh, right. you know, helping coordinate and, and plan and support the conference team, um, who by the way are rock stars and yeah. uh, have worked tirelessly for months to put this together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's been truly, truly just like an honor. I, <laughs> and, and I mean that. No, in, absolutely. In yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I believe you. Listen, um, we're here to talk about legislation and uh, some of the um, most important developments in the U.S. Uh, because that affects a lot of people, not just the uh, retail consumers, but yeah. also the people who use Bitcoin, the investors, um, all sorts of actors are involved. And, um, you know, I was just talking to another guest of mine and another person um, yesterday about how the entire space has evolved so so dramatically over the last couple of years. I remember first covering crypto a few years ago and everyone was saying how um, they're skeptical about the space. And now I have friends who don't even know what Ethereum is and they're buying NFTs. Actually, that's a bit of a stretch. You have to have Ethereum to buy NFTs. But, I mean, they don't... You don't you, have to know what it is. Yeah, exactly. You, 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 you know, people at a high level don't really understand what they're buying but there's just so much hype around it and from a retail level this hype has come with more scrutiny from u.s legislators tell us about how legislation in the u.s has evolved over the last couple of years sure um i'm gonna come at this from two fronts right yeah. because there's a lot of uh federal legislation i think that that's the one that gets the most media coverage right, right? uh there was a lot of coverage around the infrastructure bill last year and uh, certain provisions that were included in the infrastructure bill. And we can get into that in a moment. But there's also a ton of important state and local work that's being done that frankly isn't as, to put it bluntly, it's, it's not as sexy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't get riled up about uh, municipal uh, law. Mm -hmm. um, that said, sometimes those are the most important, uh, you know, pieces of the things that lay the foundation for innovation in Bitcoin uh, for companies wanting to move to a certain city or state um, and making it easier for people to transact with Bitcoin, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, the infrastructure bill was kind of where the political fight in Bitcoin kicked off. Yeah. Uh, that happened, you know, kind of midway through 2021. In the U.S., we kind of have these massive omnibus bills. And what happens is a lot of times there are um, specific pieces of legislation included in these bills uh, that sometimes are either snuck in or yeah. people don't really care about until we're about to vote on them. And so in the infrastructure bill, there were two provisions, very high level. They were severely, uh, and, and it did pass. So right. they're uh, you know, set to severely impact Bitcoin and Bitcoin users and the way we transact and the way that's regulated. And what that's done is really spur the community to take regulation and policy seriously. I, you know, I, I've been talking about um, with my other guests about how the transformative space of uh, legislation has impacted um, all actors I, I mentioned earlier. Janet Yellen, for example, uh, you know, she was uh, giving a speech in Canada a few years ago in Montreal, and she was saying how Bitcoin and cryptos at large are a vehicle for illicit activities and uh, can't be trusted. There needs to be more government crackdowns. Uh, basically, nothing good can come from Bitcoin. I'm just reading this article a few days ago. She made a speech. She said a digital dollar could become a trusted money compare comparable to physical cash. Um, and she was talking about how Bitcoin is, uh, where crypto is transformative. So really, she's changed her tune over the last couple of years. And, you know, Janet Yellen is one of the, uh, uh, you know, she's one of the hallmarks of traditional finance. She comes from a very traditional economics background. So if people like her can change, I guess other people can change. Why the change of tune? Why the change of attitude is what I'm wondering. Uh, it's interesting, right? Uh, because seemingly you're, you're coming at this from a positive perspective. Unfortunately, I look at it in okay. uh, a slightly more negative All perspective. All right, that's great, yeah. Um, I think a lot of people in the government were initially skeptical of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency at large because they viewed it as this anonymous 
way to transact that only criminals and cheats and mm-hmm. liars, that might even be a direct quote from Elizabeth Warren, yeah. you know, that only you know, criminals, cheats, and liars use uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Um, what the government has come around to the last couple of years, and they've seen it, uh, you know, China using the digital yuan, uh, the, the e-remembi, right? Um, seeing that nation states are starting to harness cryptocurrency for their own purposes, and now the U.S. is looking into creating their own central bank digital currency, a right. digital U.S. dollar. So the U.S. thinks they can take all the good of Bitcoin, but centralize it under the Federal Reserve so get all the benefits of crypto and all the benefits of, of Bitcoin in a centralized way that the government can control. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily that they've all changed their tune about Bitcoin. It's that they think that they found a way to get Americans on board with the, a version of crypto that they can control. What's that version of crypto you're talking about? A Fed coin? Essentially a Fed coin. It is a digital dollar. Uh, you know, it's known as a CBDC, a central bank digital currency. And all that means is, you know, uh, in many ways, by the way, I should clarify, mm-hmm. the dollar is already digital. Mm-hmm. Most dollars in circulation right. are online somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're, they're, yeah. they're not like real paper dollars that you're using. Sure. Um, but a CBDC would make all of it uh, essentially virtual or digital currency, um, meaning the government could instantaneously, you know, at the click of a button, change interest rates, uh, which they already can do. Um, this would just expedite and accelerate that process. They can uh, potentially, again, these are all potential implications of the CBDC, they could limit what you spend that money with. For example, think with COVID, mm-hmm. when they sent out the stimulus check. Mm-hmm. Uh, if they sent a stimulus check um, through a, keep in mind, a CBDC might also have this federal bank account component yeah. where you know you have a bank account that's tied to the Federal Reserve or, or central bank's control. And um, they could send out your stimulus check and they could say you can only use it on food, water, and Netflix. Sure. If you want to use it on Amazon, nope, sorry. Right? Cigarettes, no. And again, you know, these are hypotheticals, but essentially what a CBDC does is it gives the Fed more tools in their tool belt. Wait a minute. Has there been a historical precedent where the government says to you, Grant, you can't spend your money on Netflix? You can't spend your fiat dollars on Netflix? You can only go on Amazon Prime? Has that ever happened? Mm. So, yeah, you know, it was, it was a kind of tongue-in-cheek yeah, example. Yeah, um, no, I'm just using but, off your neck. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. you know, there, there are examples. So, you know, if, if you look at um, certain things like an energy, uh, energy, right? The government is in the business of saying what types of energy you can use, how much energy you can use, um, you know, as a business or as a consumer, things like that. Um, the government is, you know, a lot of people ask me, they go, they go grant like, uh, or they pause it. They're like, you know, the CBDC thing, right? Talk about surveillance capitalism. The government can look at all your transactions. Yeah. They can stop your transactions. That sounds like a crock. That sounds like a conspiracy theory, right? That sounds like 1984. Yeah, it sounds like 1984. And uh, it's funny because, you know, they're like, that'll never happen. We live in the U.S. We live in a democracy. Um, the government's on our side, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Um, and all I would say to that is just... Uh, Read a few books or like go on, no, literally just go on like yeah. the CIA Wikipedia or the US government like Wikipedia, click on the scandals, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and go down the list. Uh, look at the Patriot Act and look at, you know, the government spying on us without our consent. Look at ways that the government has abused their powers, uh, you know, in the past and really not ask for permission, but and not really even apologize later. Well, okay, so, yeah, all right, so, <laughs> so. Yeah, don't ask for permission, not even ask for forgiveness afterward. <laughs> yeah. No begging for forgiveness. That's just the way the government rolls. You just kind of move on. Yeah, <laughs> listen. So, but the government, okay, so they're going to institute the CBDC at some point. Um, it's in the works. Actually, I think Jerome Powell, Fed Chair Jerome Powell, has said that he wants to make digital uh, a digital dollar the most competitive in the world. Yeah. And so I think it's in the works, not officially being announced. Is it mandated, though, that uh, we as citizens have to use the CBDCs. Mm. Can I say to the government, no, I prefer to stick to my cash? Great question. And so this is what the government's trying to figure out right now. So there, I think, are over 100, I don't want to misquote that number, there are dozens of countries that are actively looking into a central bank digital currency for themselves. Yeah. The U.S. is just one of many. Uh, China is way ahead in that race. Sure. Um, you know, China banned Bitcoin, and part of that was because they wanted to strengthen their e remembi right? Yes. Um, the United States has not, you know, banned Bitcoin yet uh, in any meaningful way, right? We can talk about, uh, you know, some 
certain regulations or, or maybe trends of where things are going. But essentially, um, the government is figuring all this out. So Jerome Powell and, and some other uh, you know, people in the government who have commented on this, they're essentially saying, hey, if we want to do this, we want to do this right. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take a few years. Right. And because we don't want to botch this rollout, mm -hmm. we don't want people to lose trust in this from the beginning. We don't want the tech to be bad. We don't want there to be security flaws. One of the biggest things the government talks about with regards to cryptocurrency is like consumer protection yeah. and fraud right. and cybercrime. So if the CBDC simply perpetuates all of that, that's a failure from the government, right? So they're trying to figure all that out. My take on the CBDC is that it's going to be a few years mm -hmm. before we see one. Um, could be as long as five to ten years. Could be as soon as two to three. Mm -hmm. There is a range there. That said, uh, and, and again, I don't want to misquote a name, but um, there is uh, in the interim... Right. Um, the U.S. government has, has invested over the past few years in a program that is essentially like uh, halfway to a CBDC. Um, and so they've already invested a lot into into uh, that program. We won't need to get into specifics here. Again, don't want to misquote any like names or verbiage. Sure. Um, but there are some things in the works that make it seem like there will be interim projects that lay the foundation for a CBDC while they get it right mm -hmm. or their version of what they think is right. Okay, I read in the um, executive order that President Biden recently announced um, on, on cryptos, his executive order on cryptos. Uh, in his report, in his summary, it stated that 14% uh, of U.S. households, about 40 million people so far, have at one point traded or owned cryptocurrencies. Yes. Bitcoin is, you know, being a big part of that. If the government wanted to ban Bitcoin, could they do it? Oof. Okay, so... This is a loaded question. Yeah. Um, by the way, those numbers, we've seen various estimates. It's anywhere right. between 40 and 60 million Americans. Yeah. Uh, and sometimes we've even seen that number 40, 60, 40 to 60 million Americans who've owned Bitcoin. Right. So right. Um, it's fascinating. I always like to make the distinction between Bitcoin, not crypto. Sure, there yeah. are fundamental differences between Bitcoin, and that actually leads into the question, which is, can the government ban Bitcoin? Um, there are... Again, my personal opinion is that it is much less likely that the U.S. government is going to outright ban the use or transaction of Bitcoin in the United States. They will be able to ban or regulate or mitigate certain fundamental aspects of the uh, usage of the network in the United States. Um, and we see that a great example would be in New York. So New York currently has a piece of legislation on their state house floor um, that is a moratorium on Bitcoin mining, mm -hmm. on proof of work mining. Mm -hmm. So notice how they're not saying we're banning Bitcoin, we're just banning the fundamental consensus mechanism that makes Bitcoin Bitcoin. Mm. So it's like, so you're banning Bitcoin, right? <laughs> right. Um, so they're not explicitly saying that, right? So you can ban proof of work, you can limit proof of work, you can ban, uh, the government is interested. Limited how? Limited from the miner side or from the investment side? I mean, China's done both. Let's take China, yeah. for example. They've banned the miners. They've also, I think, banned, uh, to a certain extent, uh, custody of cryptocurrencies. Yes. Uh, you would get fined. Um, so, I mean, what, what mechanisms could the government use in the U.S., for example? Sure. Um, keep in mind, right, I, I think there's still something like 20% of the hash rate is still in China, even after they banned, <laughs> even after they banned mining. That's crazy. So, so keep in mind that, like, just because you ban something, you know, in, in law... Um, you know, de jour doesn't mean that, you know, de facto, like in, in reality that. Well, I guess this stop. whole conference would be illegal then, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We would all be criminals. Yeah. 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 What are we doing here, Grant? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. I'll see you in jail. That's a great question. Yeah. yeah I mean, you and me both. It, it's just, I, I think you it's sell me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We do this interview from the yeah. prison. Um, yeah. We'll put some cameras in there. But no, but like, uh, you know, it, it just, it's a, it's a formality, right? It becomes, legally um, a framework for illicit activities. I mean, we can't formally have this conversation anymore without being criminals. It depends. It's a scary thought. It, well, 100%. And, and really quick, like it would, it would limit the institutional aspect, right. right? There would be people running their own nodes in their home. There'd be sure, people yeah. running miners in their home, right? right. That, that's kind of where that would go. Some people have said that because of recent legislation around taxation of Bitcoin, that that's actually a positive step. If you're taxing Bitcoin, you're not going to ban Bitcoin, right? Mm. That's a great point. Uh, and yeah, so and th this kind of gets it. Um, one of these fundamental paradigms, uh, potential paradigm shifts of Bitcoin, this inflection point of Bitcoin, which is essentially like 
what is Bitcoin now? Mm -hmm. What is Bitcoin going to be in 10 years? Like, what are these use cases? Mm -hmm. um, is Bitcoin a speculative investment? <laughs> okay. Is it an inflation hedge? Right. Is it a global monetary network that people can use, right? Like, what is it? <laughs> is it you've asked a very good question. <laughs> what is, is the answer to your own question? <laughs> is it all those at once, right? So, so ultimately, I, I think it, Bitcoin has the ability to be all of those things depending on what you want it to be in that moment, right? Mm -hmm. As a global monetary network, you have people building layer two solutions like Lightning to make global payments accessible everywhere. Instant transactions, almost transaction, uh, you know, fee free, mm -hmm. right? Um, as a, an inflation hedge right now, you know, Bitcoin is not the uncorrelated asset to the stock market that everybody hopes it will be. Right. As U.S. inflation continues to rise, we're at, I think, eight and a half percent since COVID started, mm -hmm. which outpaces other uh, um, developed countries like Canada, UK, etc. Yeah. Um, vastly outpaces. Um, as that continues to rise, does that change? Um, you know, you can go to and as a speculative asset, right? Institutions are looking into, you know, ETFs for Bitcoin. They're trying to get a spot ETF for Bitcoin. Right. Um, That's happened in Canada, for example. Why has not happened uh, yet in the U.S.? Uh, there are multiple opinions on this. My personal opinion is that uh, essentially the SEC is looking for more. They've said it multiple times. They're they're really worried about consumer protection, and so uh, a lot of people think that if there is a very regulated Bitcoin specific exchange, um, not all the thousands of cryptos that are out there, not the Dogecoins and Shiba, just a regulated Bitcoin specific exchange um, that the government understands how it works and, and can have decent oversight over that a spot ETF could be regu uh, could be approved. Right now, um, the SEC just doesn't feel comfortable allowing that. Um, there are just too many unknowns in their opinion. Okay. Well, like I said, I mean, Canada's done it, so there there is a precedent for um, for, for sure. government adopting, uh, you know, spot ETF. Um, I want to close on uh, just your overall f outlook on not the price of Bitcoin, but how Bitcoin would be adopted in the future. We've seen mm. over the last ten to thirteen years, Bitcoin starting off as being well, first it was used to buy pizza, uh, then. <laughs> 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 then it was used as a trading vehicle. Uh, wasn't until relatively recently, yeah. I say relatively, in the span of um, the th last 13, 13 years, years, that Bitcoin has been adopted by institutions. Mm -hmm. Now we've seen country adoption of Bitcoin, El Salvador. Yes. There's speculation Honduras might be next. I haven't seen the announcement of the uh, Bitcoin conference yet, but there's speculation another company, another country um, in uh, perhaps the Caribbean or Latin America could be could be next. So what's next for Bitcoin? Oh man, um, I mean, tune into the live stream. You're about to see some unreal announcements on this main stage. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know what half of them are. Yeah. Um, that's how big they're supposed to be, where they're like, we can't tell a soul, right? Um, yeah, country adoption, institutional adoption. There is still billions and billions of dollars of institutional money that's tied up um, because of regulatory uncertainty. I think as we get more regulatory certainty in the space, um, you know, older people who are more risk averse, institutions who are more risk averse are going to feel more comfortable sinking their teeth into the space. Right now, there's a, a real worry that if you invest really heavily into Bitcoin, you could get rug pulled at any moment. It could get banned. It could get overregulated. The price could go down 80%, right? Um, once there's more regulatory certainty, you're going to see a lot more companies um, really innovating in the space. I hope that if the U.S. embraces it, um, yep. You know, we embrace that and, and engage and benefit from that innovation. The eighty percent drop in price, the price volatility, is a big concern for a lot of people. How is regulation going to help that? Yeah. Well, um, I, I use the word help, but change that. Mm, I mean, how is regulation going to change volatility? Yeah, I, I think volatility is is in, inherent to to the network uh, as we kind of find this adoption equilibrium, right? Yeah. We're we're at, trying to find um, that equilibrium between supply and demand as. Uh, the entire world is figuring out what the heck this thing is, mm -hmm. right? I don't know if there's a way to escape volatility in the short term. Mm -hmm. um, that said, uh, yeah, so, so regulation, I don't know if that changes the volatility. Um, all it does is change the uh, tail risks yeah. for companies so that they know that they won't, again, be rug pulled, that they won't be out billions of dollars from an investment in Bitcoin because it's gone the next day. Right, so 
don't buy Squid Game coin. It's basically what you're Please saying. don't buy Squid Game coin. <laughs> yeah, all right. If you're buying that and hoping that it goes up, maybe season two. Maybe it's, it's already been. It's maybe already now's been the time to buy. If I was, if I uh, was, no, no, um, it's already been bug pulled. I'm making a joke. Maybe season two Squid Game. Maybe coin I'll make the Squid Game coin and uh, and, you heard and, it here and first. It here. You're the guy behind Squid Game coin. <laughs> yeah, it's been anonymous. Um, please, please, this is a joke. Can't, whoever's watching, this is a joke. Please, uh, Bitcoin Magazine, please don't fire me. Um, yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, we're already going to jail because uh, apparently all this is going to be illegal at some point. Um, just on that point, yeah. do CBDCs concern you at all? 100%. Yeah. Uh, In what way? CBDCs, I think, are uh, an extension or, 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 uh, of, of government powers to the point of governmental overreach. Um, I think right now the Fed's powers are limited, and I think that's a good thing. I think uh, you know a small number of people controlling the entire country's monetary system which by proxy effectively controls much of the world's monetary system um, because of the power of the U.S. dollar. I'm not sure if that group needs more power um, over that system, especially in real time. And the last thing I'll say is like, our government has not shown uh, the ability to effectively manage um, our monetary system in a way where everything just works out smoothly all the time. We uh, look at what happened during COVID. Look what happened in the Great Recession, two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Um, quantitative easing, a lot of these practices, raising, lowering interest rates. Like um, quantitative easing is a relatively new practice. A lot yeah. of people think it's like they all know, like they all know what they're doing. A lot of this, they're almost running experiments in real time on the American people and on, on the global population. At the point where that's true, and and I'll, I'll finish up here. At the point where that's true, I I am worried that giving them more tools in their tool belt. <clears throat> is simply an opportunity to add more factors into an equation that makes it more complex and more opportunities for things to go wrong. What is the worst case scenario here once a Fed coin is implemented? I'm just I'm not making yeah. you speculate yeah. on conspiracy theories, but just speculate on what could go wrong. What could go wrong is the government starts deciding, <clears throat> uh, becomes arbiters of truth, becomes arbiters of what is okay and what is not okay mm. um, to purchase. Uh, you know what is okay to use your money and. They're already doing this, right? Um, in some ways, where uh, <clears throat> you know, and private companies are doing this as well. Excuse me, <clears throat> like you can't use a credit card in many places to buy like uh, cannabis, right? Um, you know, there there are many reasons for this, right? Uh, I can go down the line, but yeah. essentially, like the government can become arbiters of like what you are able to spend your money on. Mm -hmm. They can, uh, you know, surveil their citizens mm -hmm. to the point where we are losing civil liberties. And a lot of people say, mm -hmm. well, if you have nothing to hide. You know, you got nothing to worry about. Right. Um, but I think it's easy to say that when you are currently on the consensus, when you're on the majority, when you agree right. with what the majority is. Right. You're not always going to be on the majority, right? Um, it's very easy to see a world in 10, 20 years where the majority now, uh, in terms of thought and opinion, right. is not. Well, you know, it, it's interesting because cryptos started off as being this platform of decentralization. The CBDCs are anything but decentralized. It's, yeah. you know, sort of the polar opposite. Yeah. If people wanted to escape the centralized system that's coming, that's arguably already here, where would you go? Gold? Bitcoin? What would you buy to escape government oppression? I mean, what conference are we at, man? <laughs> yeah, you know my answer, right? Um, Bitcoin is freedom money. Uh, yeah. I would encourage you, uh, if you haven't, to read, read up on uh, what Alex Gladstein is doing. Yeah. Um, he just read his new book. I'll check your financial privilege. I think yeah. a lot of people in the U.S. don't fully understand why non-state money or non-governmental money is important. I think looking at what happens in other countries, looking at what happens to Hong Kong protesters right. who are found money's going into their bank accounts, the government sees that, yeah. they can be imprisoned, right? No um, the Ugandan Feminist Rights Coalition, uh, you know, um, the government shut down their bank accounts because they didn't like what they're doing. They opened Bitcoin wallets and they were able to raise money. It's like freedom money means so much more to people in authoritarian regimes and places with hyperinflation. That said, the U.S., just because it's a democracy, doesn't mean we're immune to yeah. governmental overreach. And if you're at the point where you're only using Bitcoin or you're only learning about it when you finally need it, I worry that it'll be too late. I'll give you an example close to home. I'm in Canada, in Ottawa, in the uh, you know, nation's capital, there was a truckers protest last month. I'm not sure if you read about it. And uh, they were raising money through uh, crowdfunding, and uh, the government blocked that money from being uh, sent to the convoy. 
and then people started raising money with Bitcoin. And the government actually, uh, Trudeau's government actually uh, 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 mandated the RCMP, the Canadian police, to tell the exchanges, to some of the crypto exchanges based in Canada, to freeze certain accounts linked to the truckers' protests. Yep. So they're already doing that, Grant. It's not, uh, it's not far-fetched to presume that what you're saying could happen on a larger scale. On a larger scale and on the other side. You know, if you look at the trucker protest as sort of a right-wing movement, yeah. uh, one of my colleagues, David Zell, um, who's the executive director of the Bitcoin Policy Institute, right. a Bitcoin think tank, he posits that there's a scenario, let's say Donald Trump gets elected again in 2024. Sure. Uh, let's say he decides that the Black Lives Matter movement is a terrorist organization. That's what the government is uh, using as uh, as an excuse for blocking funds. For blocking it's, funds, it's uh, you know we're we're monitoring terrorist financing activity. Exactly. And so we're, we've got to protect citizens from terrorism. So whether it's Antifa, Black Lives Matter, right. the trucker movement, the whoever, whatever, right? right? right. It, the point is, it can happen to anyone. It, right. It's just a matter of who's in power and who has control of these incredibly powerful systems. Mm -hmm. And again. Uh, it's less about, you know, these conspiracy theories, you know, it's less about, oh, a slippery slope. It's the, the principle of, you know, we are a country founded on, on personal liberty and personal freedoms, yes. life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Um, and ultimately, you don't have to be a libertarian to, to adopt those ideals. It's ridiculous that uh, Pete Buttigieg went on the campaign trail, you know, when he was running for, for president and said, like, it's crazy that freedom and liberty have become conservative talking points right like when did we get to that point in america where liberty and freedom are now right-wing ideologies that should be a bipartisan that should be an apartisan ideology yeah and so that's the part to me that I, I think worries me because bitcoin is freedom money it doesn't matter if you're black white uh democrat republican where you're from what you look like what you believe it, it's it, it, you are your own bank and the network doesn't care uh, and, yeah. and to me, it, it's odd that there's so much pushback against what is ostensibly just math. Yeah, we've only got a few minutes left. Tell us about your work that you're doing for, uh, well, the Bitcoin Advocacy, Advocacy Project. Um, and uh, you've got a surprise announcement coming up. Don't give us all the details. Yep. Just a teaser. Yeah. Um, so, yes, I will be announcing <laughs> the Bitcoin Advocacy Project on Friday on the main stage, 10.50 a.m. Yeah. Be there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> or <laughs> watch the live stream. Uh, yeah. Or buy a ticket. <laughs> right. um, so, uh, shameless plug. Shameless plug. Look, I don't have a financial. Buy Grant's merchandise. Yeah, buy my merch. I got a. I got a store. I'll plug it. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, I'm not even on like the conference sales no, side. I get, you know, it, I I get, get a commission. It. We're good. Uh, anyways, yeah, I'll be announcing the Bitcoin Advocacy Project on the main stage, along with some projects that we're supporting, and a yeah. very, very big, big announcement as part of that. Um, okay. But the Bitcoin Advocacy Project, we are trying to build a political movement for Bitcoiners in the United States. Right. Um, at BTC, I've been interacting with politicians, with candidates educating them on Bitcoin, uh, trying to build a, a movement of Bitcoiners, build a movement, an orange wave in Washington uh, of, of politicians who understand Bitcoin. Um, and, you know, we're at the beginning of that fight. Right. Um, but I really, really hope uh, that Bitcoiners who want to get engaged politically, uh, you know, by the end of this week, see that there are ways that they can get involved and that there are people, not just myself, uh, but plenty of others in the space doing really, really, uh, really cool work um, mm -hmm. that we're trying to engage the community with um, so that we can protect, not Bitcoin, Bitcoin doesn't need, need protection, but protect Bitcoin users in the United States. Grant, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. I learned a lot. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'll see you around. And thank you for watching Kitco News. I'm David Lynn. Stay tuned for more from Miami. Kitco News, special coverage of Bitcoin 2022 is brought to you by Coin Payments, crypto payments made easy.